The morning of August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped over Hiroshima. The horror and destruction that follow over the Japanese city are well documented, but one less known aspect of the bombing mission is that it was unclear whether the airplane that dropped the bomb would survive the strong shockwave produced by the detonation of this new weapon. Using basic trigonometry and high school physics, it is possible to plan the optimal path to maximize the distance of the aircraft to the detonation point. This is in fact the path followed right after releasing the bomb that August morning of 1945. This is the story of a maneuver designed to keep the crew safe a few seconds after the first nuclear explosion over Japan. The Enola Gay is a B-29 superfortress named by the pilot of the historic flight, Paul Tibbets, after his mother. During the early hours of August 6, 1945, it took off for a top-secret mission from Tinian Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Only three of the 12 members of the crew officially knew the nature of the cargo, the first atomic bomb to be used in combat. Without knowing the details, it was evident for the whole crew that this was a mission like no other. In particular, they all noticed that the airplane, a B-29 Super Fortress intended for heavy bombing, had been modified to carry a single but very heavy bomb. All possible extra weight was minimized, even almost all weapons had been removed. Everything was unique and they practiced the flight plan and payload delivery for months by dropping dummy bombs. The bomb release was immediately followed by an unconventional escape maneuver in which the plane was heavily tilted and quickly turned around a very specific angle before heading away in a straight line at maximum speed. In his book, Shockwave, Countdown to Hiroshima, Stephen Walker writes, at the instant of the drop of the bomb, Tibet disengaged the autopilot and he slammed the bomber straight into the right-hand diving turn, the massive bomber almost standing on its wingtip, the G-forces pinning every man to his seat. Little Boy, the uranium bomb drop over Hiroshima, was designed to detonate around 600 meters above the ground. This altitude was chosen to maximize the destructive effect of the shockwave. A primary shockwave expands spherically from the detonation point in free air. When it reaches the ground, a secondary reflected shockwave adds to the extraction of the primary. From a point in the air, like the crew on board of the Enola Gay, the two shockwaves arrive with a delay. The first blast will reach the airplane about one minute after the explosion. Therefore, the escape maneuver must use every valuable second to guarantee the integrity of the aircraft. Preliminary results from direct measurements during the Trinity test a few weeks earlier indicated that the structural survival of the airplane to the strong pressure of the shockwave could not be guaranteed at a distance less than 13 to 14 kilometers. This defined the minimum safe distance. We have an airplane that needs to escape from an incoming shockwave after dropping the bomb. The escape path can be fully characterized by the turning angle. Let's call this angle theta. For theta equals zero degrees, after dropping the bomb, the Enola Gay goes to its maximum speed, but continues on a straight line, which causes the horizontal distance between the airplane and the falling of the bomb to slowly increase. This approach worked with conventional weapons of the time, but not with an atomic bomb. The other extreme is theta equal 180 degrees. This is the obvious choice that will turn the Enola Gay around and completely away from the explosion center. However, the B-29 is a large airplane and a 180 degree maneuver will take too long. It will be better than the straight path for sure, but it will consume some valuable seconds between the bomb drop and explosion that could be better used escaping away. With this analysis, it is clear that there is a conflict 
a trade-off between how far the airplane can get and the time that it will take for the maneuver. Somewhere between theta equals 0 and theta equals 180, there is an optimal turning angle that will maximize the distance and ensure the safety of the airplane and its crew. We will simplify this problem by assuming that there is no air resistance, that the airplane does not change its altitude, and that the airplane moves uniformly after dropping the bomb at its maximum speed. None of these assumptions is exactly true, but they will have little effect on the final result. Let us first determine how far from the explosion the Enola Gay would be if it just continued in a straight path after dropping the bomb. The bomb was released from a height slightly over 9.5 kilometers, and it took 43 seconds to explode. We will call this the time of flight, T sub f. We can use this to determine the height of the explosion point. The equation for projectile motion, also known as parabolic motion, implies that the bomb exploded around 572 meters above the ground. From here we can directly infer that the vertical distance between the Enola Gay and the explosion center is over 9 kilometers. Let's call this vertical distance delta z. We will need this value later. After the explosion, the airplane continues moving horizontally until it is quickly hit by the primary shock wave. The hypotenuse of the triangle formed by the relevant points is the so-called slant range. This is the three-dimensional distance and the quantity that we want to find. It can be written as the speed of the shock wave times the time that it took to hit the enolage. Let's call this time T sub s. Similarly, the horizontal side of the triangle is given by the speed of the airplane v times the time T sub s. Since we already know the other side of the triangle given by delta z, we can use Pythagoras' theorem to relate all the sides of the triangle, from where after some simple algebra we can solve for the time t sub s. A shockwave moves at a supersonic speed, however it slows down very quickly after a couple of seconds, so let's use a value slightly over the speed of sound, say 360 meters per second. In his book Shockwave come down to Hiroshima, Stephen Walker writes about Tibets describing the maneuver and the Enola Gay's engines and screaming at full throttle with airspeed touching 350 miles per hour. From here we get the maximum speed of the Enola Gay. It was 350 miles per hour, or 156 meters per second. Plugging these numbers in our solution, we find that T sub s the time that it took the shockwave to hit the airplane would be 28 seconds. Multiplying this time by the shockwave speed, we find the Enola Gay at only 10 kilometers. This is almost 3 kilometers less than the safe distance and the airplane would likely be destroyed. In a recorded interview, Tibets describes a visit to Los Alamos to discuss the mission with Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. I told Oppenheimer that when we had dropped bombs in Europe and North Africa, we had flown straight ahead after dropping them, which is also the trajectory of the bomb. But what should we do this time? Oppenheimer said, You cannot fly straight ahead, because you will be right over the top when it blows, and nobody will ever know that you were there. Oppenheimer also gave Tibets the optimal path to escape the atomic blast. Turn 159 degrees as fast as you can and you will be able to put yourself the greatest distance from where the bomb exploded. In the words of Theodore van Kirk, the Enola Gay's navigator, we trained primarily to make a rapid turn and run away from the bomb. That was our biggest worry, to get away from the bomb. Let's see now how we can help the Enola Gay escape from the atomic blast and where the path described by Oppenheimer comes from. Suppose that instead of a straight path, as soon as the bomb is released, the airplane turns by an angle theta for some time and then continues the escape in a straight line. The practical question that we want to answer is the following. Can we find an angle theta that can maximize the slant range s? Let's label 
the four important points on the airplane's path. Point A denotes the bomb drop. This also marks the beginning of the escape maneuver. The bomb continues on a straight line, while the Enola gate churns at maximum speed until it points to an angle theta with respect to the original path. At some point B, the airplane ends the maneuver and it stops turning to continue straight. All this while the bomb is falling. 43 seconds after point A, the bomb explodes. Let's call C the location of the Enola Gay at this moment. And finally the airplane moves some extra distance before the primary shockwave hits at some point D. With this, we have turned a real-world situation into a physics problem. Let's introduce X and Y coordinates. The origin could be anywhere, but due to this curved path between A and B, choosing the center of the arc will dramatically simplify the calculations. Here we identify the object we want to find, the slant range between the target and the airplane when the shockwave hits. Using the stop view of the situation, we can use vector analysis to identify each point. To determine the vector s, we must find the coordinates of its beginning and end. Therefore, we must find the coordinates of the target t and point d. Let's begin with t. Given our choice of the center of the arc AB as the origin, the radius of the arc gives us the y component of vector t. Since it is below the x-axis, the y component has a negative sign. For the x component of t, we use the fact that during the free fall, the bomb only experiences the force of gravity. Its own weight accelerates the bomb only in the vertical direction. No forces act in the horizontal direction, so the bomb moves at a constant speed along the x-axis. The distance traveled by the bomb is just the speed, that we can call v0, multiplied by the time of flight, t sub f, that we know is 43 seconds. We have with this found the x and y components of vector t. The z component requires no calculation because we found it earlier. This is what we call delta z. Here it appears with a negative sign because the bomb moved below the origin, at the center of the arc AB. In other words, we have chosen the plane in which the Enola gate moves as z equals zero. Finding vector d will take some intermediate steps. We will make use of vector addition to find d by first finding the coordinates of vectors b and c. We start with b. By completing the right triangle formed by the segment OB, we can use trigonometry to write the components of b. The x component is the length of the segment OB, this is the radius of the arc that we call r, times the sine of the angle, in this case 180 minus theta. The sine of 180 minus theta happens to be the same as the sine of theta, so we can simplify it. And the overall minus is there because b is to the left of the y-axis. The same can be done for the y component, given by r times the cosine of the angle. Cosine of 180 minus theta is minus the cosine of theta, so we can simplify and we get an overall minus. Since we define the origin with z equals zero at the level of the airplane, all points will have z component equals zero. We found b. Let's now determine c. For this, we can make use of the coordinates of b and just add the extra segment bc. Once again, we complete the right triangle and identify the angle 180 minus theta in the left corner. The hypotenuse is given by the distance traveled by the Enola gate in that time which can be written as the speed times the time between those two points. Now we can write the x component of c as the x component of b plus the horizontal projection of the segment bc, and the y component of c as the y component of b plus the vertical projection of the segment bc. Again, the z component of c is zero. And with this, we have found c. We can now finally find d. We follow the same steps. We complete the right triangle, identify the angle 180 minus theta, and write the hypotenuse as the speed times the time between the points C and D. The x component of D is then given by the x component of C 
Plasi Horizontal Projection of Segment CD. And the Y component is just the Y component of C plus the vertical projection of segment CD. We now have all the components of vector D, so we can finally calculate the component of vector S as the difference between D and T. And with all this, we can find the slant range between the explosion center and the enola gay as the length of vector S using Pythagoras theorem. It looks like we're done, but we have introduced several unknown quantities, namely the horizontal speed of the bomb, that we call V0, the radius of the arc AB, denoted by R, and the time intervals between BC and CD. The horizontal speed of the bomb, V0, is the same as the speed of the airplane when the bomb was released. This information can be found in Richard Rhodes book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. In the chapter describing the bombing of Hiroshima, we find that the Enola Gay's ground speed then was 285 knots, about 328 miles per hour. The time intervals between BC and CD appear together, and their sum can be found after some algebra. First, we need to recall the definitions of points A to D. To the sum of the time intervals BC and CD, we can add and subtract the time at point A, when the bomb was dropped. Effectively, we are just adding zero here. Now we can rearrange terms, so we have now three intervals. The first one, T sub AC, corresponds to the time between bomb drop and explosion. This is what we earlier called the time of flight T sub F, the 43 seconds that it took for the bomb to explode, so we know this. The time interval between A and B is still unknown, but we will find it in a second. Finally, the interval CD corresponds to the time between explosion and arrival of the shock wave which earlier we called T sub S. To find the time interval AB, we consider the motion during the turning maneuver as a section of a circular motion. Here we use the definition of angular speed, which can be written as the ratio between the linear speed in the circle and the radius, but also as the angle cover in a given amount of time. In our case, the angle is theta, and the time is the time interval T sub AB that we want to find. We rearrange this equation and find that we can write this as r times the angle theta divided by the speed of the airplane during the maneuver. The last term in the expression above, the time between c and d, can be written as the distance traveled by the shock wave divided by its speed, v sub s, where s again is the slant range that we're trying to find. With all this, we have found a way to write the necessary time intervals, BC and CD, as the sum of mostly known terms. Putting the latest results together, we can rewrite this land range. Only the radius of the maneuver is missing. Let's focus on the Enola Gay during the turning maneuver. In a recorded interview, the Enola Gay's navigator, Dutch Van Kirk, explained, Right after dropping the bomb, we made a right-hand turn, 60 degrees bank, pushed the throttle forward, and just ran like hell. The key information here is the 60 degrees bank part. This gives us the roll angle of the aircraft during the maneuver. Now we can draw the forces acting on the airplane. Pointing down is the weight of the aircraft, given by the mass times acceleration of gravity g and pointing perpendicular to the wings is the lift, denoted here by F sub L. This is the force that keeps the airplane flying and forms an angle of 60 degrees with the vertical. This is the 60 degrees bank mentioned by Van Kirk. With these vectors in place, we can use Newton's second law to determine the radius of the arc. Newton's second law establishes that the sum of all forces acting on an object is equal to its mass times the total acceleration. This law is used by analyzing vertical and horizontal components separately. Along the y-axis, we have two forces, the vertical component of the lift and the weight, m times g. By choosing up to be the positive direction, then the weight appears with a negative sign. For the right-hand side of this equation, we must ask the following question. Is the airplane moving up or down? Since we have assumed no vertical motion, 
we have no acceleration in this axis, and for this reason the right-hand side of the equation is zero. From here we find that the lift can be written in terms of the weight and the roll angle. Now we move to the horizontal direction, what we call the x-axis. We only have one force acting on the object, the horizontal component of lift in the negative direction. For the right-hand side of the equation we ask the question, is the airplane moving horizontally? Here we have to consider that during the turning maneuver the aircraft is continuously moving to its right as it moves in the circular path, therefore the answer is yes, and the sum of forces is mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is given by the square of the linear speed divided by the radius, also in the negative direction. The minus signs cancel each other out, and we can write the radius in terms of the mass, the speed, the lift and the roll angle. Replacing the result from the y-axis, we find that the mass of the aircraft is irrelevant, and that the radius only depends on the speed, the acceleration of gravity, and the roll angle. These are all known quantities. In fact, using their values, we find that the radius is almost one and a half kilometers. With this, the radius of the maneuver is no longer unknown. Taking this result back to our previous calculations, we can write a final expression for the relationship between the angle theta and this land range S. It is a long and ugly expression, but we have numerical values for all the terms in this equation. It must be noticed that this land range S appears on both sides of the equation, so further manipulation is necessary if we want to find a cleaner equation for S as a function of the angle theta. However, we are not looking for a pretty expression. Our task is to find the angle theta that maximizes the slant range S. So instead of searching for a reduced analytical expression for this equation, we can just find a numerical result. We do it in the following way. We set theta equal zero and solve the equation for S. Then we repeat this 180 times. We set theta equal one degree and solve it again. Theta equal two degrees and so on. This is really long and tedious work for a human, but it's a trivial task for a computer. I wrote a short computer program to do exactly this. I programmed this equation and I asked the computer to solve it for each value of theta between zero and 180 degrees. Then we can take all the pairs, theta and s, and make a plot. And this is the final result. The slant range has a minimum at theta equals zero. This minimum value is 10.3 kilometers. This is exactly what we found in the first analysis for the naive path, in which the Enola Gay speeds up after dropping the bomb but following a straight path. The curve shows that the slant range increases for higher values of theta, and it reaches a maximum before going down. The resulting curve shows that the optimal angle is 154 degrees. This is the value that correctly compensates the maneuver, the airplane speed, and the objective of being as far as possible from the explosion center at the moment that the shockwave from the nuclear explosion hits the Enolagay. This angle leads to a slant range of almost 20 kilometers, putting the airplane and the crew beyond the safe distance as desired. During the years, there have been several articles claiming different values for this optimal angle all in the range 150 to 160 degrees. Even the official reports from the Enola Gates crew members are not consistent regarding this exact angle. Nonetheless, the curve that we found in this analysis shows that the precise angle is quite irrelevant, and in fact any angle above 120 degrees would put the Enola Gay at around 19 kilometers from the explosion, way beyond the safe range. 43 seconds after releasing the bomb, the crew saw the flash of the nuclear explosion. Around one minute later, the shockwave hit the Enola Gay. In an interview, Paul Tibbetts described this. A bright light filled the plane. The first shockwave hit us. We were 11 and a half miles slat range from the atomic explosion, but the whole airplane cracked and crinkled from the blast, like when you crush a thin can under your foot. The scientists predicted the impact of the shockwave to be somewhere between 2 and 3 g-forces. We had an accelerometer in the airplane 
to measure it. The measurement turned out to be right at 2.5 g-forces. Van Kirk also described the moment. The plane bounced, it jumped, and there was a noise like a piece of sheet metal snapping. The Enola Gay survived. The unconventional maneuver for the escape plan calculated by a scientist kept the crew safe. I find this an instructive exercise that shows how to use basic physics and mathematics to solve a practical problem. Additionally, it is always fascinating to take a bunch of equations from paper into the real world and confirm how well physics works. <laughs>